see. Okay. What? Got it. Okay. So thank you so much for having me. I am so excited to be here and to chat with all of you who are joining us, um, whether you're live on the call or watching the rec recording of this. Um, thanks for having me. I'm excited to talk with you about running nutrition, especially as you train for the half marathon and the marathon um, in November. So I wanted to share a little bit about me, who I am, um, some of my favorite things. I am a registered dietitian. Um, I'm a personal trainer. I'm a run coach. So I help uh, runners with all three things, nutrition, running, and strength. I am the owner of Emily Moore Nutrition LLC. So I work with runners one-on-one -on -one at this point. Um, I am a marathoner. Uh, actually over here, you'll see a picture of my first marathon that I did on the Capitol Trail during COVID. And I am currently training for the New York City Marathon. I'm on MTT, um, so I'll be actually running the half since the half is, I think, six days after I run New York. Um, and I, this is my family here, my two children, Annie and Brody, my fiance. I love to hike as well. So we recently took a trip to a lot of the national parks. Um, here is Bryce Canyon and we went to Zion, a lot of cool places. I am a big time foodie and I think that's what um, really caused me to become a dietitian. I love food and I want to help athletes through um, helping them with food and helping them with their, their nutrition so runners can run the best that they can and perform really well. Um, okay, so just a little bit of what I'll be sharing um, and talking about today is the building blocks of runner's nutrition, macronutrients for runners, runners plates and snacks. So how to go about building a balanced plate, a balanced snack, hydration, nutrient timing. So what to eat before, during and after exercise. And then um, as race day approaches, carb loading is gonna be really important. So I wanna chat all about carb loading and tell you everything that you need to know about that. So I break up runner's nutrition into three different parts. And honestly, the mindset piece, which you'll see down at the bottom, that is where I like to start with runners. Um, mindset is how you view food, your relationship with food, um, how you view your body, body image. I think that's a lovely place for runners to start. I find, I start there with every single one of my clients. I find that if I jump right into nutrition, meals, snacks, nutrient timings, um, sometimes, especially if runners are struggling with their mindset, um, they're struggling, struggling with dieting or restriction, a lot of times those things come um, up as challenges as we try to implement all the nutrition strategies. So just a little bit to share about mindset and what I encourage you to do is look at food through a health and performance lens. Look at eating as a form of self-care, a way to support your body. And I love to view nutrition as a tool to help athletes perform well, race well, recover well. And I do would encourage you to think optimization addition and not restriction subtraction. Most things I find are not very helpful. So what we wanna do is we wanna look at meals, snacks, and we wanna look to see how can we um, increase the nutrients that you're getting in at each meal and snack. And there are a lot of um, people that can support you if you feel like you're really struggling with your mindset, dietitians and our therapists might be helpful. And now I want to dive in to that second part. So nutrition at meals and snacks. I want to share with you all about the macronutrients for runners and what you need to know, the different types, et cetera. So there are three essential macronutrients. There's carb, fat, protein. There are technically four macronutrients. The fourth is alcohol, but that's not essential for runners. So I'll be sharing um, and talking about those three. And we really want to include all three of those on your plate at meals and snacks. We need all three to be the best runner that we can to support our energy levels and even our health. So I want to start off with carbohydrates. Carbohydrates are so important for runners. And I want to share with you about all the wonderful things carbohydrates do. So our body's preferred source of fuel is carbohydrates. We use carbohydrates for energy and then we store it as glycogen in our muscles and in our liver. And that glycogen, we want our bodies to have optimal glycogen stores because that helps to regulate our blood sugar levels. 
Um, it helps to give us energy, especially when we're out there exercising. And let me change my screen here. Okay. And our carbohydrate intake, how many carbs we are eating is going to influence those glycogen stores. Well, so take a look at these two people I have here. And you will see that this person here on the left, they're, they're not eating enough carbohydrates. They have low carbohydrate intake, whether they are unintentionally doing it or intentionally doing it, see how low their glycogen stores are. Whereas this runner here is focusing on eating enough carbohydrates at meals and snacks, their glycogen stores are going to be much fuller and their glycogen stores are going to be much more optimized than this person over here. So our goal is to have those, those glycogen stores, I often call them your energy tank, to have that optimized through eating enough carbohydrate. And this person over here, they're going to have enough glycogen to help them run faster and stronger, to postpone fatigue, to help them uh, prevent them from like bonking or hitting the wall when they are working out when they're running. And know that as your mileage increases, that your daily carbohydrate requirements are going to increase. And I put this table in here. I know that there are a lot of different approaches to nutrition. Some runners do really well at um, looking more at numbers and grams and other people do more uh, or do better with like a visual. So I'm going to show you both ways. We'll jump into runners plates and snacks and I'll show you some of those helpful visuals. But basically what I want you to get from this here on the left hand side, you'll see daily carbohydrate requirements um, and that's grams per kilogram of body weight per day. And you'll see exercise here on the right hand side. And this is going to show the intensity of training and the hours of training each day. So as we are increasing the intensity, increasing the duration of training, our carbohydrate requirements are going to increase. Okay, so another perk about carbohydrates is carbs are the primary source of energy for your brain. Um, and this is a minimum. I've read even higher in some research, but the brain uses a minimum of 130 carbs, 30 grams of carbs a day. And I want you to give you a good visual so you can see what that looks like. So we have two slices of bread, a banana, rice, a handful of pretzels. All of these together is 130 grams. And think about it, that's just one organ, that's your brain. Think about all the other organs you have. And then when you throw running on top of it, um, you need a, probably a good amount of carbohydrates in order to support your organs. And then of course your exercise. Uh, we often, as a dietitian, I often refer to carbs as protein sparing. So what does that mean? When we are chronically under fueling, we're not getting enough carbohydrates. The body is smart. The body's not going to give up. It's going to look within itself to see what other sources of fuel are available for it to break down to be able to use its energy. And unfortunately, that can include muscle and tissue. And we don't want to have our bodies break down muscle to use its energy. That can result in loss of strength and an increased risk for injury. So carbs are, pro what? Carbs are protein sparing because when we eat enough, the body doesn't have to look for other sources and your lean body mass or your muscle mass can remain in place and to help you run strong and run fast. Now, there are two main groups of carbohydrates. We have complex carbs, which are right up here. You'll see the potatoes, um, fruit, you'll see legumes, you'll see whole wheat bread. Um, whole wheat pasta, brown rice, that sort of thing is referred to as a complex carb. Also like your starchy veggies, like corn, peas, potatoes are also complex carbs. And these foods are gonna be high in fiber. And I encourage you to focus on these types of carbohydrates, these types of starches at meals and snacks away from exercise. And then the other group of carbohydrates is simple refined carbs. You'll see some examples down here. You'll see your Gatorade, you'll see pretzels, um, graham crackers, juice, that type of thing. 
And these, really the main difference between these is the fiber content, low to no fiber here. Now, I don't, a, a lot of times I see and I read, complex carbs equals good, refined carbs bad. I see that terminology and I want to get away from that. And I wanna remove that terminology because there are times when I would recommend the simple refined carbs over the complex carbs. And that is the closer we get to exercise, we want to be focusing on those simple refined carbs. Like say you have a snack within the hour of exercise. We don't wanna be focusing on all of these complex carbs because fiber slows digestion. And we're probably gonna feel that on our run that if we eat a lot of fiber before we work out, we're probably gonna have some GI issues. Okay, I whizzed through that pretty quick. Um, and I think I see some things in the chat here. I'm hoping to go through this with you and then I'm hoping to have some questions or some time at the end for questions. I'd love to answer any questions that I have. So think about them, write them down as we go through this. Now, the second macronutrient is fat and fat can also be used for energy by the body. The body actually uses like a blend of carbs and fat. Um, and it really depends on the intensity of uh, your exercise, during exercise, I should say, when your body is going to uh, prioritize one over the other. During running, our bodies can break down and use carbohydrates much more quickly and efficiently. So that's why gels, sports drinks, they have sugar, they have carbohydrates because our bodies can break them down and convert that to energy much quicker than it can fat. Um, we use fat to make hormones, which is very important. Fat is also used to absorb fat-soluble vitamins. So we see vitamin A, vitamin D, vitamin E, vitamin K. A really great uh, benefit of including fat at meals and at snacks is that it helps your body to absorb these vitamins. They need fat in order to be absorbed by the body. We store fat as adipose tissue, and it is important for us to have some body fat on us. It can help with temperature regulation. It can protect our organs and it can insulate our bodies. And then there are certain types of fat that are essential. So for example, omega-3s, omega-6s, our bodies can't make those. They're essential and really important for brain and heart health we can only get those through eating foods that will provide us with omega-6 and omega-3s. Now, unsaturated fat, and when you're looking at the food label, you'll see mono and polyunsaturated fat. Those are very beneficial to runners. They can help runners to lower their cholesterol level. As I said, they're important for brain and heart health. And I know I just went over this, but omega-3s, omega-6s are essential because our bodies can't make them. Um, some examples are like plant oils, avocado, nuts and seeds, which are also rich in omega-3s, like your wool, your flax seeds, your chia seeds, uh, fatty fish, also rich in omega-3s. Um, and the recommendation is to aim for three ounces of fatty fish to get in those omega-3s twice a week. So I like to use my hand as like a visual. I'm a very visual person as maybe you'll um, come to find through all the visuals that I have in here. But we look at our hand and the size of our palm, that's about three ounces. So two servings of that a week in fish. Um, and then generally, we want to aim for about 20 to 35% of our daily calories coming from fat. Now, protein. Um, protein is used to help repair muscles, to build muscles, and also to make hormones. And I like to think about protein. Oh, here's another visual. I like to think of protein as a block of Legos. So the whole structure is protein, but it's made up of those little individual Lego pieces, and those are amino acids. So protein is made up of these little pieces called amino acids, and there's two different types of amino acids. The first is non-essential amino acids, and I think of that as non-essential because our bodies can make them. The other type is essential amino acids, and I think of that as 
essential amino acids are essential to eat because our bodies can't make them. Um, and then when we take a step back and think about protein, there are two different groups of protein. One is called complete protein, and those contain all of the essential amino acids that our bodies can't make. And an example of a complete protein are your animal proteins like meat, seafood, eggs, dairy. Um, I should say, oh, I have to add this in here. Soy is also an example of complete plant-based protein. Um, incomplete proteins, those are missing some of those essential amino acids. Um, examples of that is your plant-based proteins um, besides soy. So we have whole grains, nuts, seeds, legumes, um, vegetables. Oh, and I have here, soy is a complete source of plant-based protein. And really a variety is key. There are a lot of vegan plant-based athletes um, who do really great and just fine um, and they're healthy and they can perform well. And it's really all about, like if you're a plant-based runner, it's just all about variety, right? Especially if you don't eat any um, animal proteins, that's okay. Incomplete proteins, we just wanna aim for variety because different plant-based proteins have different amino acid profiles. So when we aim for that variety, we're more likely to get what we um, need. And this is very general. Um, all this information is very general. If you are looking for individualized nutrition advice and help, please reach out to me. Um, but generally, protein requirements daily is 1.2 to 2 grams of protein per kilogram of body weight per day. Okay, and I wish I have so much information to share with you today. I don't have time to go over all the micronutrients. There are so many, but I want to touch base on them because they're just as important as the macronutrients. So your micronutrients, fancy word for vitamins and minerals, these are going to be just as essential to our health. They support our immune system, our energy level, our recovery, performance, et cetera. And runners can have higher micronutrient requirements and we can be at risk for micronutrient deficiencies. And I just listed a few there, iron, vitamin D. Um, we might have higher iron needs. We could have high iron losses, for example. Um, and really, when it comes to supplements, I always get asked tons of supplement questions. I don't like to supplement blindly. And actually, not knowing your blood work before starting a supplement can be harmful. So there are certain um, there are certain vitamins like vitamin C. It's water soluble. So if we take too much vitamin C, we pee it out and we're okay. But iron, for example, our bodies can't get rid of it. So if we're taking especially a higher dose of iron and we don't need iron, it can build up and reach toxic levels in the body. So we don't want to do that. I'd really recommend get your blood work done first. And then based on that, um, see if the supplement's appropriate for you. Uh, to support your vitamin and mineral requirements through food, that variety is really important. Eating a variety of color. I know it sounds kind of cheesy, but like eating the rainbow is a thing and will help you to get the vitamins and minerals um, that you need to meet your micronutrient requirements and to support your body well. Hydration. Um, oh boy, hydration is highly individualized and there's so many factors that can affect hydration, size of your body, um, exercise duration, intensity, the environment. Um, I don't know about you, but I'm a heavy sweater and I lose liters and liters of um, sweat on my long runs. Um, and it is determined by sweat rate. So I'll talk more about sweat rate. Basically, it is the amount of sweat that your body loses when you're running. Um, and there's a few different things you can talk about a little later about that. So I, hydration is so important. And really, as little as 2% fluid loss, when we see greater than 2% fluid loss, it can significantly decrease performance. Um, and also, in these, especially these warm temperatures, you can be putting your body at risk for heat-related illnesses as well. So to get an idea or to estimate your daily fluid requirements, I have this little equation for you. 
take your weight in pounds, divide by two or cut in half, cut that number in half. And that is the total daily, um, your total daily fluid requirement in ounces. Now know that if you're sweating, if you're exercising and sweating, you need to add more to make up for the losses. And like nutrition, like hydration, it doesn't start the day before or the day of your workout. It should be ongoing all throughout the week. It's really hard when you're in a deficit to catch up the day before or the day of. So I would encourage you, here are some tips. I would encourage you to sip liquids all throughout the day. Um, some people do really well with setting a phone alarm as a reminder. There are even some like water intake tracking apps. I know some people love to use those. Some people have success with that. Carrying your water bottle. Honestly, I take my water bottle and I put it right in front of me so that I can't really look at my screen without seeing it. And that helps to remind me to, to drink. So let's, I know I feel like I ran through that kind of quickly, but let's take all that info that I just covered and put it into practice. So these are my runner's plates, and I actually created these from the performance plates by the University of Colorado, Colorado Springs, um, in collaboration with the U.S. Olympic Committee. So I took their performance plates and I added some, um, I set it up like this, I added some foods here, and I will take you through each one. So the first one is the easy runner's plate. Now, I feel like I need to look at this first with you. So the easy runner's plate, that is a quarter or a fourth grain and starch, a fourth protein, and then half of that is color. And color is your fruits and vegetables, and then a source of fat. On this list here, you'll see, like you might be saying, well, what are good sources of fat? Like what counts as a fat? So here is a nice list for you here. Um, a lot of these are the unsaturated, all of these are the unsaturated fats that I chatted about when we talked about fat. You have your protein here, animal products, some plant-based proteins, some starches here, um, and then some color. There's lots and lots of color. This is just a few things here. And really this plate would be most appropriate when you're not in a training cycle. So I would say probably maybe 99.9% .9 of people that are watching this, you probably don't wanna be following an easy runner's plate. You're in a training cycle and it's not, um, not enough grain and starch for you. Um, light training, easy effort exercise. An example is maybe like 20 to 30 minutes of an easy effort run. Again, not in a training cycle. Just went over this with you here. Now a moderate play, this might be for you when you're in a training season and you'll see, actually, let me flip back quick. You'll see that on the easy runner's plate, a quarter of it is grain and starch. You see when we move up to a moderate training plate that a third of it is grain and starch. So the portion has increased a bit. Um, generally appropriate to use for about an hour a day of easy effort running or 30 minutes a day of easy effort running, maybe throwing in some speed work in there, maybe doing running um, and strength training in a day. You'll also notice that the protein remains about the same quarter of the plate and we can cut back a little bit on the color. I say that if you can eat a half a plate of color and a third of grain of starch, fourth grain of, uh, fourth plate of protein, go for it. Um, for some people, that's just a lot of volume. So we still want color there, but we don't necessarily need half the plate of color. And then your source of fat. Okay, now look at this plate, a third grain or starch. Now we're jumping up to the hard runner's plate. So you'll see, look at the car, the grain starch section. We're now moving it up to half the plate. Color kind of cuts back a bit. Color is very important. We still have that on there, but we just don't need as much anymore. We need to make room for more grains and starches. Protein remains consistent at about a quarter of the plate and then fat is um, included in there as well. So this is appropriate for you if you're in a training season or yeah, in the training season, training cycle, generally about 45 plus minutes of hard effort running. Maybe it is a tempo workout, uh, whatever, 
or it could be used before and after a long run. Now, with all these plates, I generally don't just look at the day. I generally look at the week. What are you, what are you averaging? Are you doing more um, intense workouts? Are you in peak week and are running tons of miles? So I generally don't look at the day to day, but I'll look at like week to week what training looks like. Now, the hard runners plate too, I do want to say I put in here before or after, before and after a long run at least the day before. Because remember those glycogen stores that we're trying to build and optimize? We want to go into our long run the next day with full optimized glycogen stores. So a full day of eating this hard runner's plate. And then the next day, Saturday or Sunday, um, say you're doing your long run on Saturday, then the rest of the day, at least doing that hard runner's plate. Because when you're done with your workout, your glycogen stores are probably going to be a bit low and depleted. And we want to then eat those grains and starch um, to eat those carbohydrates to help us replenish our glycogen stores. So that way we're feeling good. Our muscles are good to go. We're recovered um, and feeling good and ready to tackle that next workout that we have on our calendar. Um, during high mileage peak week, this is appropriate as well. All right. And what about snacks? Um, I get a lot of snack questions too. Snacks seem to be pretty popular. And I'm a snacker, I love my snacks. Um, snacks can be helpful to help athletes meet their high energy demands and to sustain your energy levels all throughout the day. As an athlete, you have high nutrition requirements, high energy demands. So we want to meet those and snacks can be a really good way to help you do so. Now, the anatomy of an athlete snack, what are we going to focus on? I recommend carbs and protein. So we want a carb-rich food at least in there. We want a protein-rich food in there. Um, a bonus for adding your fruit and vegetables. That's a way to get some more nutrients in. Again, thinking about optimization. How can I optimize this meal or snack? How can I add more nutrients? Um, <coughs> excuse me. And here's just some examples. Cottage cheese and an apple. Um, an RX bar, some of my favorites, but a protein bar and a banana. Crackers, cheese, some bell peppers. <coughs> Excuse me. Rice cake with a peanut butter and some strawberries. A tuna wrap with the carrots. Uh, Greek yogurt, granola, blueberries. Just some examples of, of snacks. So some tips. Planning ahead is key. And I really encourage you to plan out your meals, to take the time to grocery shop and do some sort of like meal prep, ingredient prep. And that looks different for everyone. And I think finding a system that is sustainable, that works well for you um, is key. And there are some people who tell me, you know, that I'm helping with their nutrition, they'll tell me, Emily, I need to at least give half a day on a Sunday to plan out meals, shop, prep. But I know that that doesn't work for everyone. It doesn't work for me. And it's just finding a system that works well for you. Um, pantry essentials can be really helpful. So here are some ideas um, that I have of things to keep in your pantry, things that to keep in your refrigerator freezer that maybe you didn't plan a meal for that night or you thought you were going out, but then it ended up dinner was canceled and now you have to throw together a meal or you get back from your long run and you're like, man, I need food now. What do I have available that I could put together? And with this, I do want to encourage you also to look at your training schedule and to uh, look at that to see what types of workouts that you have. Are you going to be following more of that hard runner's plate or more of the moderate just to make sure that you have enough grain and starch, let's say if you're in peak week and half that plate has to be your grain or starch, but you wanna make sure that you plan for that and that you have that um, in, on hand. I also will go as far as to like plan out my pre-workout snack, whether it's applesauce or a bagel or an English muffin or whatever, I wanna make sure that I have that so that it's available to me that I, so I can eat it before I run. Okay, nutrient timing. So we talked a little bit about mindset. 
we talked a lot about nutrition at meals, snacks, macronutrients, um, planning out meals, et cetera. And now what's left is nutrient timing. So nutrient timing, what is it? It's the strategic timing of nutrients around exercise to enhance performance and to enhance recovery. So nutrient timing is kind of a fancy word for your nutrition before, during, and after exercise. And I do wanna tell you, and this is why I, I guess, have steps or prioritize it this way, is that nutrient timing is not gonna make a whole lot of difference if you aren't in the right mindset, if you don't have your everyday nutrition at meals and snacks nailed down first. You need that strong, solid nutrition foundation before we start timing those nutrients around your exercise. Okay, so let's talk about before. I'll bring it into during, and then we'll talk about after. So before exercise, the goal of nutrition is to provide your body with energy that it can use to have a strong workout. And what you eat is going to depend on when you eat and when you start exercising, that time in between. Um, remember in the beginning when I talked about fiber, so the closer we get to exercise, we want to limit fiber. We also want to limit fat too, because fat is another nutrient, another macronutrient that can slow down digestion. And these are just some ideas, an example. So if we are, let's say we are doing a night workout. Um, having that lunch three to four hours before, um, that is your runner's plate. We just looked at those three that has carb, fat, protein, color. And of course I put fluids with all these as well. We want to stay hydrated. Now, if we're bumping that up and maybe we're um, eating two hours before exercise, we could go with a larger snack that has carbs, some protein and some fluid. An example of that, Greek yogurt parfait with fruit, granola, or maybe like a fro fruit protein smoothie. Um, and then when we bump it up, maybe we're having a snack right before exercise, like within that hour, we mostly wanna focus on low fiber carbs and some fluid. Some examples here of low fiber carbs, graham crackers, waffles, applesauce, banana, um, maybe it is a gel, maybe it's a sports drink with sugar, with carbs. Um, and here's another example too, just with the waffle. So in the hour before a workout, a uh, plain waffle, two hours before, we're gonna add a little bit more carbs here. We're gonna add some protein here. And then that runner's plate three to four hours before. During exercise, and this one's gonna be a biggie, and I encourage you to think about this now, and I'll have more to say on this, but you have time to practice, hopefully you've been practicing your during run, nutrition, hydration, electrolytes, um, but it's not too late. So I encourage you to start practicing with this now and hopefully this information will help you to feel more confident in your plan. There are three different parts to during exercise nutrition or during run nutrition. We have carb, fluid, and electrolytes. And really what we wanna do is be proactive with our nutrition during running. We want to start early in the run within the hour. There are some things that I read out there that's like start at an, at an hour and a half. No, we don't wanna do that. We want to start fueling early on. Um, those glycogen stores, so remember we eat carbohydrates, we use them as energy, we store them as glycogen. Those glycogen stores when we're running, those typically get depleted. Um, around like an hour and a half to two hours. We don't wanna start fueling then. We wanna bump it up so that we are not trying to play catch up by starting later on in the run. I'll give you some more guidelines on that in a sec. Okay. So when we are talking about carbohydrates, low fiber carbs or sugar is best. Sugar is not bad. Sugar is uh, very helpful for runners. Sugar is in a lot of our gels, our chews, our sports beans, our carb-rich um, powders. So sugar, our body can break that down and easily convert that to usable energy, provide that quick energy. Um, oh, I also wanna mention 
hold on one sec. Okay, I also want to mention that when we are running, our when we're let's say when we're sitting here, we have blood flow to our gut, our GI tract. When we are running, our muscles. Um, our tissues, they're at high demand for blood to deliver oxygen and nutrients. So when we're running, we're not going to have as much blood flow to our digestive tract because our body is going to shunt that and send that to our working muscles, to our working tissues to deliver what it needs to in order for our muscles to keep contracting and to keep working. So when we have less blood flow to the gut, our digestion is going to slow. So that's another reason why we don't want to be loading up on fatty um, foods, fatty fuel, um, high fiber fuel. We really want to focus on those easily digestible, low fiber carbs um, and low fiber foods. And how many carbs to aim for each hour really depends on the duration of exercise, not miles. So a lot of people will tell me, Emily, I usually we'll take a gel every four miles. Well, your four miles can look a lot different than someone else's. And really the carb recommendation per hour depends on how long you're running for the duration of exercise. And what I encourage you to do is you could start small. So say maybe you're listening to this and you're like, oh man, I don't take any carbs during my run. Start small and slowly build up as your training runs and training progresses. So maybe that looks like instead of doing a whole gel every 20 minutes, maybe you do a quarter of a gel or even half of a gel, see how that feels and then kind of slowly build up from there. I wanna show you that table first. Okay. So you'll see in this table here, exercise duration is over here on the left and the recommended carbohydrate intake per hour. Now, everything that I am sharing with you is all science-based, research-based, these are what the sports nutrition guidelines say. And what I encourage you to do is to look at these as guidelines, right? They're not tailored to you, your body, your training. So take these guidelines and then come up with an individualized plan for yourself. Let me know if you need help because I'd be happy to help. But look at this as a guideline, not a, not a rule. Um, so you'll see exercise duration here less than an hour, typically carbs aren't recommended. However, again, this is where individualization comes in. There are some runners who I've worked with that feel better by fueling 45 minute runs. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, one to two and a half hours, 30 to 60 grams an hour of carbs. And then when we are um, pushing uh, two and a half hours or more, 60 to 90 plus grams of carbs an hour. Now, generally, like this would be around an hour and a half to two hours, maybe this is where a half marathon falls. Um, and then the two and a half plus hours, this could be half marathon, this could also be um, a marathon. So really, when we get up here, when we are exceeding 60 grams an hour, we want to be focusing on a blend of carbohydrate types. And this is where, let's see, I have some products and things here with me. So um, this is Talwind I have here. I always have my goodies by my desk. And Talwind's gonna give me some carbs here. It has dextrose or glucose and then sucrose. So it has two different types of carbs. It's a blend of carbs. Um, where was I going with that? Um, oh, when we exceed 60 grams an hour, we wanna choose that blend. Another example is maybe maltodextrin with fructose, fructose, glucose. Why do we want to choose a blend? Our intestines, that's where absorption happens. Our intestines have these different types of transporters that help our bodies to absorb those carbs through the small intestine or the, that sugar carbs through the small intestine. And for example, glucose, our glucose transporter that helps to our bodies to absorb that glucose, that typically gets saturated and overwhelmed when we are fueling at 60 grams or more an hour. When we overwhelm one type of transporter, that can cause GI issues. That's a lot that you're putting on one type of transporter. So by choosing a blend, you can use different transporters and um, 
you would be more likely to tolerate higher intakes of carp each hour. Oh. Okay, so fluids is next. Now, fluid intake, like your daily fluid requirements, what we one of the previous slides that we looked at, fluid intake during exercise is very individualized to the runner, and it is dependent on sweat rate. And you can go about this in a few different ways. Um, sweat rate, and what you'll see over here is the Gatorade online calculator to help you figure out how much sweat you're losing during exercise. And that will help us then to create a very specific hydration plan. And that does involve weighing yourself before exercise, weighing yourself after exercise. Um, that approach is not appropriate for everyone. If the scale is triggering to you, I don't recommend to hop on it. Um, so if you aren't going to calculate your individualized sweat rate, another general recommendation is to aim for five to 10 ounces. I think of one ounce as one gulp. So five to 10 gulps every 15 to 20 minutes. Um, you can choose to sip as often as uh, you'd like within that time frame. For me, I would rather take uh, one to two sips every few minutes rather than taking big gulps like that. But again, it's about finding what works the best for you and your body. And we want to be proactive. I read some of these things and it's like, wait till you're thirsty to drink or use your thirst to guide your um, hydration during exercise. And I don't necessarily agree with that because being thirsty can be a sign of dehydration. We don't really want to wait till you're thirsty because then maybe you're in a deficit and it could be hard to climb out of the deficit, especially if you have a higher sweat rate. In your fluids, I would really recommend carbs, sodium, potassium, and other electrolytes, which I'll cover on the next slide. And why I recommend that, especially carbohydrates and sodium, is that these help your body to absorb fluids. And this can enhance fluid absorption. So it can be helpful in having those in there to help your body more efficiently absorb that fluid that you're drinking. Um, general recommendation for fluid intake is to bring fluids with you, take sips of fluids when you're running an hour or over. But again, I can't say this enough, individualization is very important. Now, during exercise electrolytes, uh, I want you to take a peek over here at this visual called electrolytes lost through sweat. And I want to show you the specific electrolytes that we lose in our sweat. We lose sodium, chloride, potassium, magnesium, and calcium. And you'll see down here, it says from highest to lowest amount lost through sweat. So we have the potential to lose the most sodium, the most chloride, the most potassium, and we lose smaller amounts or trace amounts of magnesium or calcium. Your sweat electrolyte composition is going to be individual to you. There are some runners who I find lose very little sweat there are, or little sodium. There are some runners who lose a lot of sodium. Um, and to find your individual sweat um, or electrolyte composition of your sweat. There are some products out there, some things out there. Um, Levelin is a company where they send you two sweat tests. You, I believe, I, have, I don't have experience with this, but I believe you wear a patch on your arm, you exercise with it, you mail it back, they analyze it, and then they email you this report. From my understanding, that's how it works. Um, H-Drop is a newer, thing on the market, which is pretty cool. I have experience with that. I absolutely love it. It's like this little band that you can wear around your arm and it will tell you it's connected to an app on your phone. You start the app um, so it knows that you're exercising and to analyze your sweat, but it tells you your sweat loss per hour. It tells you your sodium and potassium loss. So those are some things. If you wanted to get very individualized there, you can look into those. Signs of a salty sweater. So as I said, we have the potential to lose the most amount of sodium in our sweat out of all of the electrolytes. So here are signs that you are a salty sweater, I call it, or that you lose a good amount, a high amount of sodium or salt 
phases where it's interchangeably sodium or salt through your sweat. Um, have you ever been running and at the end of your run, you look down, and you have all these white crystals on your arms, maybe they're on your face, maybe they're on your legs. Those are, that's salt that your body is losing. That's a sign that you're a salty sweater. Um, I have noticed this myself. If I wear a hat running, I'm doing a long run and I'm sweating a lot. Sometimes I look at my hat and on the inside brim of my hat is a white stain, that's salt. This also can happen on the neck of shirts. That's like a common place, all salt. Signs that you're a salty sweater. I hope that you are looking at the sodium that you're taking in and including products um, that have sodium and will provide your body with sodium. This is in here, it's very general, but the recommendation is at least 300 to 600 milligrams of sodium an hour. At minimum, some runner, runners need less, some more. Um, and really, I've seen salt get up to 2000 milligrams uh, for loss per liter of sweat in some athletes. That is high, that is very significant. So the range kind of, again, is individualized and de it depends on where you are. Now, hyponatremia can happen from a over drinking or drinking dilute fluids like a lot of water with high sodium loss. So the sodium level in your blood can drop and become um, low. That could be very dangerous. Nausea, vomiting, headaches, confusion, fatigue are all some signs of hyponatremia. So what I want you to get out of this is that I hope that you have some sort of sodium source, whether it is a gel that has a higher amount of electrolytes, or I know I recently heard on marathon or the yeah the marathon course that noon endurance. I know I used to use noon sport, but I heard noon endurance is going to be available, which I absolutely love because we have carbs in here. We have a really great amount of sodium. We have chloride, potassium, calcium, magnesium. So we have all of those electrolytes that we lose in our sweat. So if you are planning to use what is available on the course, um, know that with through noon endurance that you're getting some of these. I would encourage you that if you plan to use noon endurance on the race or on the course of the race, I hope that you're practicing with it during. So make sure to take advantage of the time that you have to practice your hydration, electrolytes, and nutrition. Now, after exercise, I often refer to post-run or post-exercise nutrition as recovery nutrition. The goal is to provide your body with the nutrients to support a quick recovery. And if you are giving your body the nutrients that it needs in order to recover, um, if you are eating enough calories to recover, you're going to have a faster recovery. Now, a delayed or a lack of nutrition after exercise can cause a delayed or slower recovery, which we don't want. So there are three parts of recovery nutrition that I want to chat about. The first is carbohydrates. As I said earlier, carbohydrates after exercise can help to replenish those glycogen stores that are going to probably be depleted after your long run um, or run. Uh, it also can be helpful from that muscle recovery. Protein, essential for muscle repair and recovery. And then fluids and electrolytes to help replenish the losses that have occurred during exercise. So what I would encourage you to aim for, and there's no magical window, but again, I don't want you to delay your nutrition to then delay your recovery. So what I encourage you to do is try to get that runner's plate in within two hours of finishing your workout. Now you can start off by having a snack, and this is something that I do. I feel like I need a little snack and then I can recover, do what I gotta do, shower, you know, make my meal and then have my meal when I'm like fresh and feeling good and going into that recovery phase. So you can grab a snack. And this is just an example. I always bring something to my races and I always try to bring afterwards a snack. So I'll bring like a protein, pre-made protein drink, banana, water, just an idea. Um, and then follow that up 
with a runner's plate within two hours of finishing a workout. Okay, awesome. So we finished nutrient timing and I had to throw carb loading in here because I want you to know all about carb loading and then encourage you to practice at least one day of it when you're training. Carb loading is very race specific. So there are lots of awesome benefits of carb loading where we will be running a race for over 90 minutes. Research so, shows that there's not much benefit of carb loading for shorter races. The goal of carb loading is to optimize those glycogen stores so that you go into your race to optimize glycogen stores in a full energy tank. The benefits of carb loading is that it can postpone fatigue during running, extend the duration of steady state exercise by 20% and improve endurance performance by two to 3%. So lots of good things that carb loading can do for us. These are the sports nutrition guidelines for carb loading. I wanna take you through this. So we have one, two, three days of carb loading here. We wanna carb load for at least two, if not three days. So two to three days of carb loading before your race. So you carb load, carb load, carb load, race. And we wanna couple this with a taper. So we don't, and I know most coaches and most plans don't have you doing long runs, very high intense runs within the few days before your race. So we wanna to try to couple this with rest because when we're carb loading, we're trying to optimize those glycogen stores. And if we're going to be doing a lot of long um, runs or like long intense runs, that's kind of defeating the purpose. Um, some coaches, including myself, will put like shakeout runs in there totally fine. Um, and the carb loading goal. So what is the goal there when you're carb loading? It might be on the high tune. I'll give you an example on the next slide. But we want to carb load at a goal of 10 to 12 grams of carbohydrate per kilogram per day. And we want to do aim for that all two to three days. Uh, and I'll show you what that looks like. So Let's see, what is 70 kilograms? I gotta do my math. So 70 kilogram runner, 70 times 2.2. Okay, 154, 155 pound runner. Um, their carb loading goal based on that 10 to 12 grams per kilogram of body weight per day is 700 to 840 grams a day. Now it might seem like a lot, but I promise you that with practice, if you've never done carb loading before, you might be like, holy crap, I don't know about that. That is a lot. But with practice and with some of these tips that I want to share with you next, with practice, it gets easier. And then you're just used to carb loading for all your longer races. Some tips for carb loading. How the heck are you going to get in all those carbs to meet your goal? Um, low fiber carbs are really the best. If you think about it, we're significantly increasing your carbohydrate intake. We don't want to be significantly increasing fiber with that because there is such thing as too much fiber. Um, also, fiber can slow down digestion. So tolerating a larger volume of food can be very tough. So it's just for two to three days before a race. You can go back to eating whole grains and beans and lots of fruits and vegetables after the race only for a few days, it'll be okay. Um, Carb-rich fluids, like sports drinks, juice, low fiber smoothies, yogurt drinks, chocolate milk, those are all can be so helpful because we can get in a lot of carbs with those beverages without so much volume that like pasta or bread or bagels or something else could provide. So mixing in those carb-rich fluids uh, whether it be at meals or even in between meals, sipping something with carbs throughout the day can be really helpful. Also, you'll see my pictures of honey and maple syrup, because again, these will give you a lovely amount of carbohydrates, but without so much volume um, of food. And I do want to say that they, there will be times, and this happens to me every time I carb load, there will be times when you might not feel like eating or drinking. But of course, without overstuffing yourself or getting sick, like we wanna do the best that we can to still eat a little snack or to still drink some carb-rich fluids because we know it's going to help our performance on race day. Small frequent meals is another little tip. So smaller frequent meals, snacks, grazing throughout the day can be really helpful too. And this is so important, listen up here. Some weight gain is normal. 
feeling stiff, heavy, normal. It's okay. That's what I expect from my runners when they do their carb loading according to plan. Why is weight gain normal? Because with each gram of glycogen we store, we store two to three grams of water with it. So our body is storing a lot of water with that. It is not true body weight that your body's going to gain in two to three days. Most of that's going to be water. And I recommend that if the scale is triggering to you, if it makes you feel uncomfortable, just avoid that scale during a carb loading. Avoid that scale um, every day if that's what makes you feel better. Um, but especially during carb loading, avoid that scale because I know that my runners carb loaded right when their weight goes up a few pounds. So just some carb loading foods, carb loading ideas, um, like your white rice, pasta, bread, bagel, English muffin, some snacky things here, potatoes, bananas. One of my favorites are those, I think they're nature's bakery or something bars. Um, I know that they're really popular and I love those. Those are really great for carb loading. Some of the drinks that I have here, Scratch Labs, Gatorade with sugar, Talent, Noon Endurance even. You can totally sip on that all throughout the day. Whoops, I'm back. <coughs> Excuse me. Other nutrition considerations. Finding what works the best for you and your body during training and your training during training is key. Focus on you and your nutrition and don't worry about other what others are doing. I have worked with some runners and they're like, I don't know if I should bring fluids or gels because no one else is. Don't worry about other what others are doing and do what is best for you and your body. Practice. I can't say this enough. Practice, practice, practice your nutrition during training. It's not too late. Um, we still have, let's see, about two months or so to go. So practicing now, starting now, it's not too late. You have enough time. Start practicing your nutrition all throughout the week, your hydration, and then your nutrition before, during, and after running. Um, and what I encourage you to do is start thinking now, I don't know if you can see these notifications, so I'm just gonna cancel them. Okay. Um, oh, okay, we're back. Um, start identifying now your dinner the night before your tra long training runs. During training is the time to figure out what works really well as a pre-race dinner. And by trialing out different meals, um, the night before your long runs, that's a really good way to do so. Also practice breakfast the morning, um, the morning of. So get up, eat your breakfast, like practice everything that you plan to do on race day. Figure out what combo of foods, the timing and all of that. Now, I always encourage my runners to do some sort of race stimulation where we are treating a training run now for marathoners, we'll probably do it when we're running 15, 20, you know, our 15 to 20 mile run. Maybe we have to do this like one or two different times, but we want to treat one of our training runs as race day. And we want to do everything that we plan to do leading up to race day. So here are some things to think about practicing. We want to carb load at least one day prior to training. You can do two to three days. It might be overkill. At least practice one day of your carb loading plan. We want to hydrate with the same exact sports, sports drinks that we plan to use. We want to eat our pre-race dinner the night before. We want to eat our pre-race breakfast and snacks the morning of. We want to try to start our training run around a similar time. Um, I will definitely be doing this. I think in New York this year, New York Marathon, I think I start at like 10.30, 11 o'clock. So my nutrition right now is going to be a lot different than my nutrition um, on race day, I'm currently running at, with MTC at like six, well, I think seven o'clock now. I didn't go to the last training run, but seven o'clock and I'm going to be running hours after that. So there will be a time during my training where I'm going to try to start my long run as hard as it will be around 10, 30, 30 or 11. So I can especially practice my nutrition leading up to that. We want to follow our race day fueling plan during running. 
Um, and just a little thing here, not nutrition related, but I totally recommend that you wear your race day outfit. Test it out. Does it rub in any weird places? Um, is it uncomfortable in any way? Wear the same shoes that you'll race in as well. Okay, that was a lot, um, but thank you so much for listening. I hope that you had some really good takeaways from this. Um, I would love to hear questions that you have and hopefully I'll be able to answer those. Emily, do you suggest um, sports drinks only if you're carrying water or a sports drink or some sort of fluid with you? Do you suggest carrying sports drink or water if mm -hmm. you're if you're fueling with, for instance, I've been fueling with pretzels and waffles and they seem to give me that little bit of energy. And I keep thinking, am I overdoing it by also adding in sports drinks like noon, for example? Uh-huh. The lovely thing about adding carbs to our beverages is that they can they help with food absorption, they enhance food absorption. But not only that, but they can help to get to your goal for carbs per hour. So I find that we can look at everything that we're fueling with, the pretzels, the waffle, the sports drink, and try to figure out, and I encourage everyone to do this, is even like write it down and try to get an idea of where you're at with fueling during running. Um, how many grams of carbs are you at? Would it be helpful to add um, noon endurance or another sports drink of your choosing? Would it be helpful to bump your carbs up, you know, per hour and help you reach your goals better? Um, there are some runners who will run with both. Again, it's like kind of trialing it out now and finding what feels good to you and what works well for you. Yes, I agree because I tend to dilute my noon because I, I don't want to overload on mm -hmm. the electrolytes, but on the other hand, um, I find that I am one of those people that need extra electrolytes. So, I'm, I, you know, some people say, oh no, I just carry water. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, that's in my head. Should I just be carrying water or should I be carrying this noon or some sort of electrolyte water? Yeah. So it's individual. Um Gen yes, it's individualized. Generally, I would say having some electrolytes, having some carbs in your beverage is going to be very helpful. Because even if you're like, maybe your goal is not necessarily to like race it, but just to like have fun, like you're still going to be out there and you're still going to be running and you're still going to be losing a lot of sweat and your body's still going to be needing carbs and electrolytes. So right. Yeah, I would say maybe try to trial some noon endurance or another sports drink. Okay, thank you. Yeah, yeah. I think Caitlin Berry, do you have a question? Yes, Emily, I was wondering if you could share some of your ideas for during race nutrition that is not gels and like the carbohydrate rich beverages, some of like the real food options that mm -hmm. um, you've had some clients who have success with. Yes, I love that question. Yes, and food, whether it's food or sports products, again, practicing with those things now, but there are so many options out there, right? Sometimes it could be very overwhelming. When it comes to food, like if you want to um, play around with the waffles or even the honey stinger, the honey stinger waffles, or I guess that's um, a sports product, but even like pretzels or dates, um, that's a popular one, even honey packets. So I've had some clients who have fueled with honey packets. Um, you could get like those little ones. They could be easy to tuck away. Those um, banana chips, even like the sweetened banana chips. I'm trying to think, those are the ideas that popped in my head. I'll think of more as soon as I get off this call. <laughs> um, we have a question in the chat. It Sure. Is peak week your longest training run or the week leading up to the marathon or both? Peak week is generally when you run the most miles during your training cycle. So if you're running 
an example is if you're running a marathon, maybe you're getting to 18 miles, maybe you're getting to 20 and you have some other runs built in there and you're running the most miles that you have during your training cycle, that's generally what we refer to as peak week. The week before the run, usually we'll do it like taper where we're cutting back the miles um, to let our bodies recover for race week or for the race. Generally, two, I would say two to three weeks before the race. That's what we consider tapering. Um, another question. In trying to find and tweak that fuel hydration balance, is there an easy basic cadence I can begin with for alternating between noon goo and salt stick chewables in terms of every X minutes and or every X miles? Oh boy, I feel like I have to read that. Okay, yeah. <laughs> let me read that again. <laughs> okay, thanks for your question. Let me just take a second to read that. I'm trying to find. It should be the I'll final keep... question. Oh, I see. Um, well, okay, let me know if I'm not answering your question. But I think I hear you saying, how can you get all this in uh, when you're running each hour? So how to alternate between the noon endurance and your fluids, goo gels, and salt, salt stick chews. Um, so you could actually Again, find out what works the best for you. Some people prefer and most people tolerate taking goos, taking gels with a sports drink like Noon Endurance um, or Gatorade Endurance or whatever you're using. Here you said Noon. You can take them together. You can take your goo with water. Um, you could take your sips in between taking your goos. You could take your salt stick chews with your Noon Endurance there really is no like set recommendation. We really want to look at per hour how you are getting and meeting your fluid requirements, your carbohydrate requirements, your electrolyte requirements, and then how you would like to distribute that each hour. So an example could be to take sips of your noon, um, to take, let's say, five sips of noon every 15 to 20 minutes, taking a goo every 25 minutes, and then either taking goo and salt stick at the same time, if that's what you prefer, or you could take your salt stick kind of in between those times. So I know that that wasn't probably the answer that you were looking for, but there are a lot of different combos um, that you could do. You could take them together or separate. I hope I answered that question. Okay. <laughs> Any, Any other, other questions? I, I do wanna say that if you would like one-on-one -on -one help with your nutrition, send me an email, my email's below. I am very active on my Instagram and I post, I try to post things daily, like runner's nutrition tips. You can also get to my weekly newsletter. I provide a weekly newsletter where I give out weekly nutrition tips for runners. So. Um, if you're interested in following along and learning more, um, reach out to me or connect with me um, through Instagram as well. Um, it looks like we have one more question. Oh. Is the outcome you're testing for just not hitting the wall on your run? The outcome for testing? Um, just really, I don't know. I mean, that could be a very big outcome and a big goal. But I think something else to think about besides that is so we're testing out your nutrition to make sure that you can tolerate it and that it works well for you we don't want to get to race day and then try a new product we don't uh, nothing new on race week we don't want to do anything like that and your carb loading plan nothing new no new, new recipes no new restaurants etc but we want to find a plan that works the best for us that gives us energy to run that helps to fuel our body and to help us feel good all throughout the run and to maybe pr any last minute questions thank all you right, well oh yes janet <laughs> no no thank you <laughs> Just think. 
Uh, thank, thank you, Emily. You. This is great. <laughs> So this recording will be available afterwards. So it will, it may take a little bit to get on each website, but it'll be on the um, MTT website and the HMTT website.